building behind me in Kennington Park Road, South London, used to be a pawnbroker's shop. In 1849, a young lad came here looking for a job. What's your name? Uh, William Booth. Any experience? Uh, seven years apprenticeship in Nottingham, sir. All right, you're on. Six days a week you work for me, okay? Evenings as well, all day. Sundays is yours. But back home by 10 o'clock, otherwise I'll lock the door on you. Each Sunday, William went out preaching on the local Methodist circuit. But with an eight-mile walk after an evening service in Greenwich, that 10 o'clock deadline was often difficult to beat. But he was a powerful preacher. So much so that a local businessman, Edward Rabbits, who ran a boot and shoe chain, offered to pay his expenses so that he could preach full time. Well, it was Edward Rabbits who took him to a meeting one Good Friday. And among those present was a petite, dark-eyed, delicate young lass called Catherine Mumford. William had met Catherine a couple of times before, but on this occasion, he asked if he could escort her home to Brixton. William was a very happy man. It was his 23rd birthday, and he had fallen head over heels in love with Catherine. And they both knew it. I'm sorry to cause you to leave the service early. Thank you for escorting me home. That's a pleasure. I thought you gave a very fine sermon. Thank you. the young lovers were soon parted. William was offered a Methodist circuit in the Lincolnshire Fens around Spalding. 
And although it was just 100 miles from London, there was no nipping down the motorway in those days, no reassuring voice on the other end of a telephone. As far as William was concerned, he'd left his beloved Catherine on the other side of the world. The postman was their only link. My dearest William, ever since you went, I have gone to bed much earlier and have not dreamed about you once, to my great disappointment. Was pleased to hear you had about me. It would be a comfort to see you, even in fancy. I was really ill and thought much of you. Oh, how much I wanted your hand on my aching head. Got better, went and preached, and then came home and made a hearty dinner of goose. I fear, my love, you are not sufficiently careful as to diet. Do exercise self-denial in these things. As to preaching, I am all anxiety about you. It is monstrous to think of you preaching ten sermons in one week. If you do so again, I shall be quite angry. But that didn't stop him asking her for a helping hand. I want a sermon on the flood, one on Jonah, and one on the judgment. Send me some bare thoughts. Nothing moves the people like the terrific. They must have hellfire flashed before their eyes, or they will not move. Beware against mere animal excitement in your services. I do think noise made by the preacher and the Christians in church is productive of evil only. I don't think the gospel needs roaring and foaming to make it effective, and to some it would make it ridiculous. Well, when an excited animal tipped William out of his trap and William continued using it, Catherine was furious. You doubtless hurt your back with falling, and then you go and risk your life a second time without necessity. This displays a sad want of prudence and a sad forgetfulness of me. Pray, never ride behind that horse again if you love me. But there were dangers other than physical ones. My dearest love, beware of ambition. Ambition, even to save souls, may not be good. But ambition simply to glorify God must be. Tell God your will and desire is to be holy, leaving him to choose your employment and position. Thank you for your good advice. You have more to do with my resolves and struggles than anyone. She was clearly upset at William's suggestion that she had more influence on what he did than Jesus. Dearest, think not more of me than you ought to think. I do want to be next to Christ in your affections. I am glad to hear you say you love me best when you love Jesus most. It is a good sign. The nearer we are to him, the nearer we will be to each other. Do you think that... Um... On June 16th, over three years after that momentous carriage ride to Brixton, William and Catherine were married by the Reverend Dr. David Thomas at Stockwell New Chapel. They spent a week's honeymoon at Ryde in the Isle of Wight and the second week conducting a preaching mission in Guernsey. That's the sort of people they were. That was their story. That was their song.
The letters Catherine wrote from her parlour in Brixton reveal just one lover's quarrel. It was to do with Dr. Thomas, the man who married them. He had said that women gave it into the devil more easily than men, and that is why they were the weaker sex. And to Catherine's absolute fury, William sided with the minister. Catherine maintained that physical strength apart, men and women were equal. Anything a man could do, a woman could do, even preaching. Well, now, in the far-off days before women's lib, when the nice Victorian ladies accepted the fact that a woman's place was in the home, this was revolutionary. William backpedaled. He wouldn't go so far as to encourage a woman to preach, but he wouldn't try and stop her, which was just as well. In due course, after their marriage, William went to Gateshead as minister of the Bethesda Chapel. The day of Pentecost was fully come. They were all, with one accord, in one place. One wet Sunday morning, he looked down from his pulpit on a congregation of well over a thousand. William, I have something to say. My dear wife wishes to speak. My dear friends, many times God has moved me to speak, but I have lacked the courage to do so. Today, I must be obedient to the spirit. The Gateshead folk were stunned. Their minister's wife was such a shy person. I didn't know she could talk like that, man. She's got power. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together. Catherine was to go on to greater triumphs. For nearly 30 years after that, people packed churches and chapels, Salvation Army citadels, and even the Albert Hall to hear. Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our... When Booth founded the Salvation Army, it was logical right from the beginning that women officers should preach and act with the same authority as men. And they certainly justified themselves. There wasn't anything that was too tough to handle. In fact, Booth often said that some of his best men were women. That was certainly true of his wife and of his daughter, Kate. Catherine Booth was a minister's wife. She visited drunks and dealt with down and outs. She became a preacher and a writer, but she was also the mother of eight children, three boys and five girls, of whom Kate was the eldest. Only a mother like Catherine would have let Katie do what Katie did.
one day a call came through to the Salvation Army, come and do for Paris what you have done for London. The army had preached Christ to drunks, thieves and vagabonds and changed their lives. Well, in the Paris of the 1880s, whilst the young bloods roared their approval of the Cancan girls at the Moulin Rouge, criminals, cutthroats and violent revolutionaries were a threat to decent people. Religion was a dirty word and preachers could get killed. It was into this vicious underworld that the Booths sent their 22-year-old daughter. Her only companions were 19-year-old Florence Soper and 18-year-old Adelaide Cox. The girls hired two rooms in a rundown tenement occupied by prostitutes and rats. These fading trade signs in an alley just off what was the Rue d'Angoulême show that it was an area of small workshops and forges. The girls cleaned out a filthy old factory building to make the first Salle de Salut, Salvation Army Hall. At six in the morning, they were outside the stations where workers crowded into the city wearing sandwich boards to advertise their meetings. The girls could only speak schoolgirl French, but the language wasn't the only thing they learned quickly. They pinned their bonnet straps instead of sewing them because men drinking on the boulevards used to grab them from behind and try and strangle them. But they got their audiences, some of them so vicious that the police refused to enter the hall. They made fun of the girls' uniforms, they mimicked their accents, they laughed as they knelt to pray, and lit their cigars with pages of the Bible. But the girls kept at it. Kate got quite a reputation for singing and praying in bars and uh, bistros. Bonjour, monsieur. Ah. Direz-vous le journal de l'Armée du Salut? Ah, uh, oui, oui, merci. Mademoiselle? Um, how much do you want? This? Merci OK. Beaucoup, ah, merci, ma. This uh, is the French version of the war cry. Now, Kate initially wanted to call it l'amour, love. But the pretty young girl walking around Paris shouting, l'amour, un sou, love for a penny would have got a prize reaction from the guys who were already trying to proposition them in any case. So, it became en avant. Forward. Kate wrote a song called Aimé Toujours, Malgré Tout, Aimé Toujours, which means go on loving whatever happens. Well, the crowds reveled in this, didn't they? Mais certainement, we are French, we are always loving. Uh -huh -huh. Ici, chérie. To the Parisians, the girls had become a source of entertainment. The mobs just wanted to sing, dance, and catcall. So Kate tried a new tactic. I'll give you 20 minutes to dance in my hall if you'll give me 20 minutes to talk to you. Well, one fella jumped up, he said, Fair play, citizens! And he timed the dancing. They then listened in silence whilst Kate talked to them for an hour and 20 minutes. Kate had won. Soon they were filling a new hall holding 1,200 people. Her father was the general, but to the French, Kate was la maréchale, the marshal. The army was here to stay.
Catherine and Kate won an unusual equality with men that some might think a denial of freedom. I asked General Eva Burroughs if it was true that when a Salvation Army officer married, he or she had to marry another Salvation Army officer. Yes, because that's been a principle that we've had right from the beginning, that husband and wife have a joint covenant in the ministry of Jesus Christ. Actually, my mother and father were Salvation Army officers, and my mother, she shared the ministry of preaching with my father. Actually, she was a better preacher than my father, <laughs> but they both preached God's Word. She went in the visitation and pastoral ministry. She went in the public houses, and yet at the same time, she looked after our family, nine of us, and taught us the kind of loving, compassionate lifestyle that she had, so that they were both in a joint commitment, sharing that ministry of Jesus Christ. And you yourself, you are not married. That's right. Uh, so that doesn't make any difference, does it? No, well, that's what God has called me to, you see. I believe there's a place for the single and celibate person in the ministry of Jesus Christ. For example, I'm the world leader of the Salvation Army, and actually I feel I can do it very effectively because I am single. I haven't got the pressures of an immediate family to di distract me from totally giving myself to the people and the work of God. And, uh, you know, this is something like a gift from God. Uh, I believe the family is God's purpose for society, but some people God calls to this kind of ministry. And... Um, Really, God is nobody's debtor. If he asks you to give up something for him, in my case, marriage, then he gives you far more in return. I mean, I have the esteem and love and affection of Salvationists in all around the world, and that nourishes my life. This barge down on the Seine used to be a wartime block ship. For the last 40 years, it's been used as a men's hostel. In order to get to the mess room, the officer in charge has to pass through the men's sleeping quarters. Yet a lady officer skippered this barge for many years with great success. Well, why not? This has been the story of two army heroines, Kate, La Marachale, and Catherine, her mother. Catherine was to be revered the world over as the army mother. Certainly the Salvation Army wouldn't have been what it is without her. There's no love story more romantic or passionate than the one which started with that carriage ride to Brixton one April day when Victoria was queen. Yet, much as they loved each other, William and Catherine tried to love God more. God first was their watchword for an army of men and women marching onward. Thank you.